and Councilman for the 24th District. <clears throat> and I want to welcome everyone to our sixth COVID-19 virtual town hall. I am very proud to represent the neighborhoods of Kew Gardens Hills, Pominock, Electchester, Fresh Meadows, Hillcrest, Jamaica Estates, Briarwood, Parkway Village, Jamaica Hills, and Jamaica. And as chair of the New York City Council Committee on the Justice System, I oversee much of the criminal and civil legal system here in New York City, including the district attorneys, the public defenders, the civil legal services providers who are funded by our tax dollars, and the courts. I hope all of you are receiving our daily COVID-19 email updates um, and seeing them on Facebook. If you are not and you wish to sign up, there is a link to sign up on my COVID-19 information webpage at the New York City Council. It's Google Rory Lanceman, you'll find me. The COVID-19 webpage also has an archive of previous daily emails and town halls so you can catch up. They're pretty informative um, and I think that you will enjoy and consider it worthwhile to take a look at them. Our district office remains open for business virtually. You can call us at 718-217-4969. You can email us at rlansman at council.nyc.gov. <clears throat> you can tweet at us at Rory Lansman, or you can send us a message via Facebook. 57 years ago, in the famous case of Gideon versus Wainwright, the Supreme Court acknowledged a basic due process right to a lawyer in criminal proceedings. You know the whole, you have a right to an attorney and if you cannot afford one, an attorney will be provided on your behalf that we all see in the TV and, and movies when someone's getting arrested. That is because the legal system can be complex, confusing, frightening, and the stakes are too high for someone accused of a crime to not have a lawyer representing their interest and protecting their rights. But that right to an attorney does not apply in civil cases. That means you could face the loss of your apartment, your house, custody of your children, garnishment of your wages, and so many other harms in civil legal proceedings. What former Chief Judge Jonathan Lippman called the essentials of life, without a lawyer if you cannot afford one. I am happy to say that the New York City Council is proud to invest over 170, New York City rather, is proud to invest over $170 million a year, including more than $31 million from the City Council in funding for civil legal services representation. Dozens of different organizations across the city in every borough get funding to provide lawyers, to defend against eviction and foreclosure, in family and domestic violence services, legal immigration related matters, veterans legal issues, workplace rights, and other crucially important civil legal services. And two of these great organizations and their lawyers have joined us tonight to answer your questions. First, let me um, thank our co-hosts, my fellow elected officials who co-sponsored or co-sponsoring Tonight's Zoom, Congressman Gregory Meeks, State Senator Leroy Comrie, State Senator James Sanders, Assembly Members Clyde Vanell, Alicia Heinemann, David Weprin, and Council Members Donovan Richards, Adrian Adams, and I, Danique Miller. Some of them will be joining us tonight for a few minutes. Um, we are all extremely busy. Today we had a huge City Council budget hearing with the Police Commissioner that was chaired by Councilman Richards. Um, and I want to give them an opportunity to say a few words when they do uh, pop in. Um, for those of you who want to ask a question of our panelists, when we get to that point, you, will, you can open the Q&A window in your Zoom control panel, and Sam, our moderator, will reply. And when the time comes, you can get asked your question. Those of you who are calling in uh, and not on uh, video on Zoom, you can email your questions to cd24sam at gmail.com or text them to 347-498-4826. We will put a, um, a something up on, on the Zoom 
uh, when we get to that part of our conversation tonight. Um, but if you are on the phone calling in, it's cd24sam at gmail.com, or you can text Sam at 347-498-4826. Now, let's hear from uh, our co-hosts who have joined us. If I'm not mistaken, I think um, we have uh, Senator Leroy Comrie. Sam, can you uh, can you unmute Senator Comrie, and we could say he could say a few words. And by the way, I was I was teasing uh, Senator Comrie at an earlier Zoom. Uh, we had a little bit of a competition amongst us as to who has the best background. As you can see, I'm uh, joining you from the uh, gallery of the United States Supreme Court, and uh, I hope that you all are enjoying my view. Senator Comrie, you there? Congratulations on getting your master's. Congratulations. Leroy, um, we just need you to speak up a little bit. A little bit. We're having trouble with your with your volume. I know you've been unmuted, but we're not able to hear you right now. I'll tell you what. Um, Sam, let's go to uh, Assemblyman Weprin while we wait for uh, Senator Comrie to, to get his audio uh, in order. Uh, David, welcome. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councilman Lanceman, uh, for doing this. Uh, when I, I served in the city council as well uh, for eight years, and uh, I was a chair of the finance committee uh, during those eight years and civil legal services were a priority for us back then. Uh, I'm sure the numbers have increased uh, since I was in the city council and I wanna thank uh, Councilman Lanceman for his leadership on that. Uh, we also provide uh, funding uh, in Albany uh, for civil legal services, very, very important as uh, the councilman uh, opened up with. Uh, again, of course, part of the problem now during this pandemic uh, is that the courts are closed except for emergency proceedings, uh, and uh, people are not having the same access to civil legal services that they would uh, during normal times. So that makes the uh, civil legal services even more important in some ways because, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, catch up to do uh, when the pandemic ends. So, uh, you know, I, I want to uh, thank Councilman Lanceman uh, for emphasizing uh, this aspect and this uh, these legal services. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, when the pandemic is over, there's gonna be a huge backlog uh, and uh, that money will come in handy uh, to get uh, the services to those uh, constituents of all of ours uh, that are really uh, in need of civil legal services. Uh, thank you, Councilman Lanceman. Thank you, David. Um, and now we go back to, to Senator Comrie. I, I, I see him there. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm here. All right, um, now we and now we can hear you. Even more important. Okay, well, thank you. I just wanted to thank you, Councilmember Lanson. There's a lot going on this evening. I'm actually on three different uh, events that are happening between six and eight o'clock. Uh, but this is important. This is an important opportunity for the community to learn about the uh, legal services that are available to them now. I really want to thank all the panelists and and, and my colleagues for. Um, the panelists are taking time to be on the, the Zoom conference this evening. My colleagues in government that we've been working to try to make sure that uh, we are coordinated in our efforts to service the community. I see um, my colleagues uh, and friends, Council Member um, Danique Miller, Donovan Richards are on the line also. And I just want to encourage everyone to reach out to all of our offices and ask questions. All of our offices are open uh, remotely. Um, by phone or by email. So please, um, again, to the panelists, thank you. Uh, to all of the participants, one of the things that we need to do is fill out the census so that we can get the resources to make sure that we have uh, a full amount of people in the court system, a full amount of people that can represent us in civil legal services at any time. They want to cut the budget. One of the first things they want to cut is aid to the indig in 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 indigent. indigent. So, and um, aid to people that most need it the most. Uh, so it's important that we fill out the census because we cannot continue to try to provide resources for people uh, when we don't get the full funding to do so. It's getting more and more difficult. Everything is through analytics, so please fill out the census. Thank you, Senator. Um, thank you, Councilmember Lansman, for putting this together. And 
Um, if you have any questions for me, please let uh, this council member Lance me know I'm going to bounce out and bounce back to another event. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Comrie. Um, next, uh, uh, I'd love to hear from uh, my colleague. Uh, I have two colleagues on the on the Zoom. Uh, let's start with Council Member Donovan Richards, who had, as I mentioned before, quite a busy day with the, uh, the hearing on the Public Safety Committee with Commissioner Shea. Well, thank you so much, Councilman Lanspan, to all the co-sponsors, to all the organizations, legal minds on uh, this specific call. I, I want to thank you for the work you're doing day in and day out. And, and, and uh, Council Member Lanceman, Supreme Court sounds just about right when I, uh, when I think of your name. Um, you know, listen, tonight is a, is a very important uh, night for folks to learn about the services that are out there uh, and to know your rights, most importantly. You know, education is key uh, during a moment, especially during this pandemic when so many of us are facing challenges around the borough. Uh, around different issues, whether it's housing, whether it's criminal, whether it's civil. Um, or the most important thing you should know is that there is help out there for you. And guess what? It's, it's the city council's job uh, without other elected officials. I know Councilmember Miller is, is on as well to really fight to make sure that those resources stay intact uh, to service, as Senator Comrie put it, uh, many of our communities who are primarily all almost always underserved. So we understand that many of the people on these calls fill the gaps uh, and really do some great work day in and day out to assist our communities. So I wanna thank you for putting this together. For, uh, for those who are on this Zoom, and I have to hop off, I have two other Zooms. Uh, I have three other Zooms actually, uh, unbelievable, how you can be in the house and be at four meetings at one time. Um, but you know, we, we have an obligation to make sure that you know what's out there for you uh, please take advantage of the services. Don't be shy. Uh, you know, one of the things we often find is people um, are scared uh, to ask questions. There's no such thing as a bad question. Uh, the only question that's bad is the question that is not asked. So please don't hesitate to reach out to these groups, get assistance. And once again, I want to thank Councilmember Lanceman uh, for always being on the front lines. And, and, I, and I, I will say, he, I'm the yin, he's the yang. He's Justice <laughs> Committee, I'm Public Safety. We work hand in hand together, and it's just been an honor to do that over the course of the last few years to really bring uh, resources, but more importantly, justice to our community. So thank you, Councilmember Lanceman. Thank you, Judge thank Lanceman. you, Councilman. Um, so, so Councilman Richards mentioned that he, his committee oversees public, um, the police, my committee oversees the district attorneys. If you put the two of us together, that's an episode of Law and Order right there. Um, Council Member Denise Miller, who is chair of the uh, Civil Service and Labor Committee, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, and I oversee the workforce. So, um, <laughs> thank you for having me, Council Member Land, uh, Lansman. Um, and to my colleagues, uh, the co hosts here, uh, thank you all for your collaboration and allowing us to serve our, our, our the, the constituency, the greater Queens community. And, and, and the city of New York. Um, but I again want to just thank you, Councilmember uh, Lanceman, for your leadership. Um, you know, I have an opportunity to work with this guy on a daily basis, and, and, and you make us proud, man. You, you really, really uh, make us proud. And that's coming from me. So, um, and, and, and the work that we do collaboratively uh, is, is, is something to, to, to undertake. Um, tonight's event is, is, is really important. Um, at any given moment, uh, your, your, your civil and, and, and legal concerns, um, folks need to know the rules of engagement that are often changing, uh, particularly in the time of COVID-19. And uh, there's also folk out there who prey on victims of COVID-19 as they prey on other uh, uh, victims during uh, times of, uh, uh, of weakness. And so there's a bunch of predatory practices that I'm sure will get covered by uh, our esteemed uh, legal minds that are on the line there. Um, but it is very important that if you, if, if you, the, for those that are on the line now, text someone and let them know, because these are the phone calls that we field all the time. These are the legal questions that our officers get all the time and quite frankly don't have the ability or capacity to answer. You can get these answers, your questions answered 
and, and most importantly, uh, accurately and free of charge right here this evening. So um, I'm going to jump off and I'm going to make sure that we continue to blast it on social media and that people know that they can have their questions answered uh, here this evening uh, in a way that's really going to support them, their families, and their communities. Again, uh, Councilmember Lansman, thank you for your leadership on these legal matters. We can always depend on you to stand on the right side of justice here. Uh, and uh, I'm excited about this program here tonight, but to continue work uh, that we have happening at the City Council and with the collaboration of our colleagues here in government in Southeast Queens. So thank you again and look forward to some really exciting uh, questions and answers here this evening. Thank you very much, Councilman Miller. All right, let's get to our panelists. Um, we have uh, two organizations represented here. We have uh, the Legal Aid Society and um, Queens Legal Services. And from the Legal Aid Society, we have Hassan Shafikula, the attorney in charge of the immigration law practice. We have Young Lee, who is the director of the employment law practice. We have Jean Callahan, who is the attorney in charge of the elder law practice. And from Queens Legal Services, we have Brian Dworkin, the Deputy Director of Family Law and Domestic Violence Unit, and Alex Maltezos, who is the Senior Staff Attorney in the Housing and Foreclosure Unit at Queens Legal Services. Why don't we start off with Hassan, because um, we get a lot of uh, queries uh, about uh, immigration issues. And um, Hassan, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us what um, what kind of services uh, uh, you provide, and and a little background on what you're what you're seeing out there, and 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 what people should know, and then we'll get to the specific questions later. Okay, sounds good. Um, hope if you can't hear me, just tell me to speak up. So my name is Hassan Shafikul. I'm the attorney in charge of the immigration practice at Legal Aid. We have a fairly large organization in terms of immigration. We have about seventy people right now. So we do a range of different things. We do deportation defense for people who are detained by ICE and held by ICE in jails around New York City. Um, we do non-detained removal defense. We do affirmative immigration benefits. So if you, it's not about stopping a deportation, but trying to get your green card or become a citizen or bring family members here, all that sort of work. Um, and we have a federal practice, a range of different things. Right now, under COVID, um, there's been a lot of questions about what's really happening in immigration. Um, for people who are in ICE custody, the detained cases are continuing. Those have not stopped, um, you know, under the pandemic. So we're continuing to fight to get people out. We've um, had almost 40 people released from ICE custody because of concerns about COVID in the jails or because they have um, compelling reasons to be released, um, which we're very excited about. Um, but we continue fight for, fighting for the people who are still in ICE detention and at tremendous risk of um, contracting COVID because COVID is in the jail. For people who are, um, whose cases, whose immigration cases are not um, in the detained posture, um, those cases are suspended right now. Um, so if you had a court hearing that was scheduled at any time from early March until um, May 29th, those hearings have all been um, postponed. And you should be getting an updated notice in the mail telling you when to go in for your next hearing. Um, if, you're, if you don't get one or if you just want to check, you can contact the Immigration Court's um, automated helpline at 1-800-898-7180 after May 29th and um, keep checking until it tells you when your next court date is. If you have a case with USCIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services, those hearings have been postponed as well until at least June 4th. And there too, you should be getting a notice in the mail um, telling you when your case was rescheduled to, and that includes fingerprinting appointments, the biometrics appointments. And if you don't get a notice, you can contact the USCIS customer service number, which I don't remember by heart, but it's on their website. Um, if you go to USCIS.gov. And the last thing I'll say is if you have a check-in with ICE, if you have a final order of removal and you needed to check in every now and then, um, you can contact um, ICE as well to find out when your next check-in is. 
um, that number off, I don't remember, but if you go to the Legal Aid website, which is legalaidnyc.org, and just type in COVID, go to our COVID page and it'll give you all the dates that I'm talking about and the different numbers to call, um, whether it's Immigration Court or USCIS or ICE. Good, good, okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Um, next, uh, we'll mix it up. Why don't we hear from uh, Queens Legal Services? How about uh, Brian Dworkin, who is again, the Deputy Director of Family Law and Domestic Violence Unit at Queens Legal Services. Uh, thank you. So uh, our practice uh, typically includes doing divorces in the Supreme Court and doing uh, custody and visitation and family offense and child support and spousal support matters in the family court. Uh, the emphasis of our practice is on serving uh, victims of domestic violence who either reside here in Queens County or have cases in the Queens County courts. Uh, since the uh, shelter in place order has gone into effect, the courthouses are closed, but the court is open. The New York City Family Court is operating through a combination of uh, video and telephone conferencing and emails, servicing primarily emergency matters, which include filings for orders of protection, child protective proceedings, juvenile delinquency proceedings. Um, the other parts of the family court are available for communication, but generally not active at this time. Uh, just very recently, the family court has opened up a email box to receive uh, support modification petitions for persons who need to have their support obligations adjusted because they've had a loss of uh, income. Uh, primarily due to being out of out of a job since the shutdown. The uh, in the Supreme Court, uh, pending divorce cases are active. The judges who are handling these cases are reaching out to attorneys and to litigants to conference the cases to determine whether things can progress, whether there might be agreements. Uh, and you know, basically to offer assistance how the court might be of help in moving the cases along. However, no new divorces can be filed at this time. Every couple of weeks, the Office of Court Administration has been expanding uh, access to what is possible in the court system. It's expanding the technology that has been made available to all the court officials. Uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, and so we, you know, we uh, work within the parameters that the court is allowing us to be active and otherwise spend the rest of our time facilitating communication with clients and with our community partners and with the family justice centers and with the local agencies, keeping everybody apprised of what is happening uh, in the legal world. Queens Legal Services, all of our advocates are working. We're all working remotely. We're all open for business. Our central uh, legal services NYC hotline is open to receive calls. Uh, and the Queens Legal Services domestic violence hotline is also open to receive calls. And I can send those numbers out over the uh, chat line maybe in a little bit. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, uh, let's now hear from uh, <clears throat> Jean Callahan the attorney in charge of the elder law practice at the Legal Aid Society. We had a, um, one of our virtual town halls was on, on senior uh, issues. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't realize um, that, that there's the availability of, of legal representation uh, for seniors for various issues they have to deal with. So welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm, uh... So I'm Jean Callahan. I'm, I'm actually the attorney in charge of the Brooklyn Neighborhood Office, but um, that's also where our elder law practice is housed. And so we have, a, we have a pretty robust practice. And my background before I came back to legal aid was in elder law and is particularly around elder abuse, uh, scams and frauds uh, against older adults. 
um, guardianship, decision making, access to healthcare, those kinds of things, as well as as housing and, and public benefits. So, um, so yeah. So as you know, I mean, you know, New York City has a tremendously high number of of, of older adults uh, living amongst us and living in senior housing and. We do see um, so many of our clients that we're seeing just in the course of things are in that category of older adults, which we think of as sort of 60 plus. Um, I will say that during the time of COVID, we've seen a real uptick in, um, you know, sadly, family members of, you know, seniors living with their partners, seniors living with their, their spouse or family members who've passed away. And we all know, I mean, a number of them have, and it's been a real struggle for people to get access to the surrogates court or to get access to the person's apartment. Um, I've seen a lot of requests for powers of attorney, which also sadly, sometimes it's sort of past the point where we can offer that service. Um, but, um, but we are trying to give people the best advice that we can. Um, and as Hassan pointed out, you know, Legal Aid has a really good resource guide for COVID benefits, which I encourage people to go to our website and look at. There's also uh, call lines and where it's a specific issue around elder law, we are routing those to our elder law experts. Um, it's a small practice, but a very, uh, a very uh, experienced staff um, managing those. So, um, and then finally, I just, you know, I think people should, you know, I, we all see it, but especially with the stimulus checks going out and with people unable to get in person to banks, I think there's a really high risk of frauds and scams against older people. Um, so if you're hearing about those things, I would like to hear about it. Um, and I know that our director of, of elder law, Alex Riley, would also be interested in hearing those. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Um, all right, so now let's go back to Queen's Legal Services and let's hear from Alex Maltezos, who is the senior staff attorney in the Housing and Foreclosure Unit. And this being Queen's, very glad to see that it's, it's housing and foreclosure because we, especially a lot of my, my colleagues as well, we represent a lot of uh, homeowners and tenants. Right, so I actually have experience in, in, in um, the, the tenants side. Uh, that's where I started my practice. And for the past uh, few years, I've been working in the foreclosure side. We represent homeowners uh, who live in, in their houses, one to four families. Uh, we represent them in uh, the settlement conference part and uh, sometimes into litigation. Um, you know, I also have that experience. I'm here. I could answer uh, uh, tenant side questions as well if, if the audience has has any. Okay. Um, and and last but not least, um, uh, Young Lee, who is the director of the employment law practice at the Legal Aid Society, and um, that's something that is near and dear to my heart. That's what I used to do mostly when I was a practicing lawyer. And also in the council, we uh, funded a specific um, uh, program or, or funding, created a funding stream for uh, employee rights uh, litigation and, and, and legal guidance. So, uh, Young, welcome. There. there you go. There you go. Um, well, thank you. Um, my name is Young Lee. I'm the director of the Legal Aid Society's Employment Law Unit. Um, so we are able to assist people who, workers who either live in the five boroughs of New York City or where the work is based in New York City. Um, and, you know, before the COVID uh, crisis is happening, um, our practice covered uh, many different areas of employment law. Um, we do a lot of wage theft issues, so people need to be paid correctly. Um, there are you know, minimum wage and overtime, um, oh, uh, and we also do workplace discrimination issues. Um, New York City has one of the strongest um, anti-discrimination laws uh, in the country, the New York City Human Rights Law, and it includes many protections for people who work in New York City. Um, we do family and medical leave issues. Um, so there are a variety of uh, re 
laws that cover when and if someone is allowed to take time off of work to care for themselves or a uh, family member or other loved one. Um, we have done, um, uh, increasingly we have done more labor trafficking issues. Um, they are, unfortunately, it's a problem um, and it's a serious problem and, you know, in Queens, we do see uh, that uh, occur. Um, I'm a proud Jackson Heights resident um, and we do unfortunately see that issue here uh, in this neighborhood as well. Um, and we do unemployment insurance, which is a very hot topic right now. Um, so we, our practice really prior to this has been defending um, uh, and representing claimants at unemployment insurance hearings when either the employer is uh, challenging the receipt of unemployment benefits or the Department of Labor for whatever reason has denied a person unemployment benefits. Um, we are able to represent them at hearings. Um, and, you know, just to talk briefly about what's been going on currently, um, unemployment is a big issue. Unfortunately, so many people are out of work um, and need a uh, means of income replacement. Um, and uh, for people who have been following this issue, unfortunately, the New York State Department of Labor is um, struggling to meet the needs of New Yorkers applying. As it's just too many people applying at the same time, and the system, the Department of Labor system, has been um, has you know there has not been sufficient investment in that system, um, so it's antiquated. So people who do have problems, um, we have been trying to help them um, either through advice and counsel, or by trying to use whatever connections we have in order to see what's going on. Because unfortunately, there have been people waiting four, five, six weeks um, with no response from the Department of Labor. Um, and you know, we've been working and advocating with the Department of Labor to try to figure out you know, a better way that in getting money, much needed money in people's pockets. Um, then there are groups of people who are you know, the essential workers out there who are doing, are out in the, who are still working and really to a lot of extent putting their lives at risk. We get a lot of those calls about, you know, what, you know, what the employer's obligations are um, and if and when a person um, need, can not, can stop going to work, you know, if they are immunocompromised or if they have, you know, someone they're taking care of who they can't risk bringing this virus back home. Um, we can provide, uh, you know, help with those issues. Um, and, to, and to a certain extent, we can still help with all the other issues we've always helped with. Um, although the state sort of court systems all remain mostly closed, they're slowly starting to open up. Um, the, the federal court systems, where we bring a lot of our litigation, that, that has never stopped. Um, and we are still litigating, litigating those cases and getting results in those cases. Um, and then there are uh, complaints that can go to government agencies. Um, uh, you know, you can file a wage complaint still with the New York State Department of Labor. Um, you can file a discrimination claim still with the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And we represent people at all these different courts. So um, to the extent that people have general questions about employment um, or, or seeking specific uh, help with specific issues, um, we're open for business. Uh, and we, uh, uh, the, the, again, we'll, we'll send the... Uh, the access to benefits helpline, that's a way to get through to us so to, to see if we can help you. Um, but, you know, if you have any of these issues, please let us know and we'll try to help. Thank you very, very much. Um, so let me remind the, the people who are uh, our audience, uh, whether you're on Zoom or, or you're uh, calling in, if you uh, want to ask a question, there is the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen on Zoom and go into that, ask your question and we will try to get to you. If you are um, uh, uh, calling in and you can't uh, uh, see the screen, uh, you can email any questions you have to cd24sam, as in Council District 24, cd24sam at gmail.com, or you can text them to 347-498-4826. Four eight two six, and if you want, and you're shy, and you don't want to to ask your question uh, on the screen, and you want us to ask it for you, which which uh, saw a lot of people seem to prefer, uh, maybe it's because we're all sitting at home in our pajamas, and we don't need the rest of the world to to see that. Um, I'm happy to ask them for you. So let's start. Um, we'll start with Young Lee. Just 
where, 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 you, where you left off. One of the biggest issues that I get in my office is the unemployment insurance claims. And, and that's a bureaucratic, administrative, political with a lowercase p problem. But on the legal side, um, what uh, uh, circumstances are there where a person is eligible or ineligible for unemployment insurance um, if you've lost your job because of the coronavirus, if your employer is contesting, what would be the basis of contesting? You know, it's, it's not completely automatic that you get unemployment insurance. So what are the, the legal uh, hurdles and issues and standards there? That's a, that's a question that we get a lot of. I would just start with, for anybody who is doubting whether or not they uh, uh, are eligible for unemployment insurance, they should apply. I mean, that's actually number one. You never let the Department of Labor make a decision, but give the most accurate information you can. And if you are denied, call us or another legal advocate who can help you maybe challenge that denial. But generally speaking, in order to be eligible for unemployment insurance, you have to have lost work with, uh, through no fault of your own. Um, uh, you know, so if you the business has shut down because of COVID, that sort of um, you have to have sufficient earnings within what's known as a base period. So if you're looking back, let's say roughly 18 months, you, it, it, within one of those calendar quarters, you have to have earned at least $2,600. And in the remaining quarters, you'll have to have earned at least half of that. So it's not a tremendous amount, um, but you have to have alert, earned at least $2,600 in one of those quarters and about $1,300 in the remaining quarters. Um, and then you have to be ready, willing, and able to work uh, when, if, and when and if you are able to find a job. Um, and then you also have to be looking for work. So all those being considered, obviously things have changed with the current situation. Um, that is traditional unemployment insurance. With the passage of the Federal CARES Act at the end of March, they expanded unemployment insurance to include what's known as Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, or PUA. Now that sort of covers a, a ground that un traditional unemployment insurance never used to cover. Most importantly, it covers independent contractors and self-employed people. So those, uh, those, pe those people are not considered employees, so aren't considered uh, eligible for traditional unemployment insurance. So again, if you are self-employed um, or are an independent contractor and have lost work, all your work because of that, you are eligible, you should apply. Um, the, all those criteria I talked about before, the, what the federal law has said and what the Department of Labor has told us is they're loosening some of these requirements. So what that means is work search. How are, you, how are people supposed to be looking for work when there is no work out there? Um, you, you still have to make attempts, um, but there's going to be, I guess, an understanding that it may be difficult to actually secure another job at this point. Um, also, uh, one of the big categories of people who are eligible, um, typically, if you are providing child care, you're not usually eligible for unemployment because the Department of Labor will consider you not ready, willing, able to go to work because you're taking care of your child. But with the pandemic unemployment assistance, that specifically covers people who are, cannot, uh, who have lost their job because of due to school closure and they must remain home in order to take care of their children. Um, so those are really the broad strokes of unemployment insurance and the new pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, and, and you know, to the extent that anybody is being deemed ineligible and you're actually getting a determination, uh, we would love to see that because we, uh, you know, our position is the Department of Labor should be approving um, as many applications as possible and, you know, using a very liberal uh, uh, analysis in, in order to do so. Um, so, you know, if anybody's getting denied, you know, please reach out. We want to see if we can assist. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have a, a, an immigration uh, question. Um, somebody wants to know, will, if they um, avail themselves of any of the benefit programs that are out there, uh, for, um, for everyone, including our immigrant uh, friends and neighbors and constituents, will, will this count uh, negatively um, for the public charge um, mm. uh, exception or however you want to phrase it? And maybe you can, can explain that a, a little bit. 
Yeah, you know, so it's a good question and it's a lot of people's minds right now. The so public charge is one way that the government, um, it's a barrier basically to, between you and getting your green card. You have to show that you're not going to be primarily dependent on the government for assistance. It's been the test in the past, primarily dependent. The government under Trump has created a new rule for public charge um, where it's not like you're primarily dependent on welfare benefits, but they created this crazy new system where if you get certain benefits for 12 months out of a 36 month period, they're gonna say you're a public charge and we're not gonna give you your green card. So it's horrible, we, we actually at Legal Aid, we have um, a lawsuit ending challenging the new rule. Um, we had a nationwide injunction, which the Supreme Court struck down and we're fighting that again. Um, so what about the benefits for people who are experiencing symptoms of COVID or if you wanna get tested for COVID or you have symptoms and you want, want to go to the hospital? So one, one of the rare nice things that the administration did is they said, if you need to get tested for COVID or if you need to receive treatment for COVID symptoms, that will not count against you for public charge. So that would not hurt your chances of getting your green card. So of all the things we have to worry about during COVID, at least that's not one that we need to worry about. I would just like to add that unemployment insurance is, does not implicate public charge. So uh, you, you should not worry about applying for unemployment insurance and having it work against you for these purposes. Got it. Okay. Um, so let me uh, ask a question of a family question, family law question of, of Brian. Um, someone has a custody agreement with their ex that allows visitation, um, concerns about safety with the pandemic, whether just going out at all or whether the ex is really observing um, uh, the, 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 the safety rules that, that he's supposed to. Um, what can someone do? Yeah, so this uh, has been pretty much the most popular question for families put to us and certainly the first two months of uh, the public health emergency. Uh, you know, for uh, people who have an existing court order that prescribes how parenting time is supposed to be carried out, as an advocate, we certainly want to encourage parents to sit down if they can and have a reasoned and informed discussion about how to best protect their child or children. I've encouraged people, if they can, to have a conversation with a pediatrician. Um, if uh, if um, they need intervention possibly from somebody who could be a mediator or, or a third person who you know, might be able to offer some, some neutral ground for having the discussion, that's helpful. Uh, the way that the uh, court system uh, is responding at this point, I think that during the first few weeks, there was a lot of uh, reticence to uh, take strong positions uh, in hopes that people would work it out among themselves because parents are the ones who are in the best seat to judge the situation for their own children. Uh, um, but as we have moved along in time, it has become clear that absent uh, some significant health factor, uh, the courts expect the orders that are in place to be observed. The courts are expecting parents to behave reasonably with each other, to look for creative alternatives where they might be possible. A lot of parents have made agreements among themselves to facilitate extra Skyping time or FaceTiming time or telephone time. Um, I will say that the judges I have spoken to in conference have also said they expect all parties concerned to be observing uh, the public health protocols. They expect children not to be exposed unnecessarily to third parties outside the household. 
Um, they certainly expect people to be wearing masks and observe their social distancing, not to be uh, out exposing themselves unnecessarily to situations where they then might pass something on to their children. Uh, but basically where we are right now is that we are advising people that absent some specific health condition, either to a parent or to the child, or something definitive regarding uh, failure to observe the public health protocols, uh, that the orders need to be observed. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, folks, if you want to ask your question yourself, you are very welcome to do that, but you can't be logged on anonymously. That's just a Zoom thing. That's not our policy, unless, Sam, unless I'm, I'm mistaken. So um, uh, I will, uh, I will take the questions and, and ask them myself. But if you want to ask them yourself, um, you, you've got to go on with your, your name. Um, let's ask a housing question of, of Alex. Uh, people understand that there's uh, a moratorium on evictions, but um, like, what does that mean? Do I, do, I, do I have to pay my rent? Um, is there also a moratorium on foreclosures? And um, uh, what, are my, what are my legal obligations? Sure. The, I think the moratorium is, is often misunderstood. People think that, um, I think people often think that, you know, it's, it's, uh, they're not going to be required to uh, pay money that's coming due. That's, that's a big mistake that's going to lead to, uh, many people uh, in, in, to a bad place. Um, in the context of the uh, mortgages, the, the moratorium is for a, a period of time. There's forbearance, there's different forbearance period, periods uh, for different, different mortgages, uh, depending on who secures them or who's insuring them. Um, but that does not mean that th those payments go away. Those payments will have to be made at some point. Um, my office saw at the end of Sandy when, when there was a similar, similar moratorium that a lot of the servicers requested the payments at the end of the moratorium. They didn't uh, you know, uh, automatically put them into a payment plan or capitalize them, put them at the end of the mortgage. Um, so we are uh, advising everybody to get, uh, to contact their, their servicers individually and ask them what, what these forbearances uh, will lead to in the future. So they are aware of what their responsible responsibility would be at the end of the 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 state imposed moratorium uh for the the tenants Wait, before, um, sorry before sure. we move off to the, the tenants for the homeowners with the mortgage um are there any uh rules guidelines requirements of what these forbearances must must include and, and incorporate or or you know could be could be anything because i i saw one where it seemed like um, you get a forbearance for X amount of time, and then at the conclusion of that forbearance, everything that was not paid is due at that time with interest. Like, yeah. like, like some six month payment is, is due in one shot. So there are some rules for the, the, the federally insured ones, which we believe make up about a third of uh, the mortgages out there. All of the, uh, the other mortgages are, are held by trusts, or, or banks hold them themselves and they have different servicing rules. That's why we're, we're advising that individual borrowers go and, and ask their servicer for what the, the, the program that, that they're using um, is gonna look like. And they should do that on their, on their um, mortgage statement, monthly mortgage statement, there is a place to uh, write questions. There's a specific address for questions. They should write to that specific um, address and ask them what, what uh, uh, programs am I going to be eligible due to COVID-19 uh, forbearance agreements. Um, and they, they need to get that in writing so that they can hold their servicer to that when 
um, they need to. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, for okay. for the tenants, yes. yeah, for the tenants again, they're similar. They're you know there's a moratorium on evictions, but that doesn't mean that you're you don't owe the rent, unfortunately. Um, so, so again, we're advising people um, pay if you can, um, and if not, reach out to a, one of the legal services organizations to kind of explore the different options uh, for ongoing. Uh, rental assistance and and let me ask you i don't i don't know if I think you covered this um if uh a landlord is now not providing services heat electricity whatever um the normal times when court is fully operational the the tenant can bring a proceeding what is there any legal recourse available to a tenant in that circumstance now yeah so the housing court is uh taking on very certain cases. Uh, one category is what you're pointing out, which is uh, HP actions. If you have a bad condition in your house, that is one of the few cases that the, the housing court is still hearing. They're also hearing um, lockout cases. If your landlord locks you out of your building right now, you can bring that emergency case. Um, I think those are the two, the, the two main ones that they're hearing right now. But again, yeah, you, you can file for repairs. You can file for, you know, no heat, no water. Um, the, the housing court will hear that during during the, the shutdown. Got it. Okay, um, let's ask an, an, an elder law uh, question. Um, you know, a lot of seniors are living on their own, um, but they need help and assistance and, and Maybe this isn't the best way to put it. Oversight, so they don't, you know, fall victim to a, a scam or something. Um, uh, what is guardianship, and is that a solution of any kind? And 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 are those cases being heard, um, so that as people are are distant from each other, uh, an elderly uh, uh, a relative can be can be looked after and and be protected. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would say, um, as a general rule, guardianship is not the solution. If you just need to look after a loved one, um, it's not, it's not, uh, not the way to go. Uh, I think it's a sort of last resort and a real, uh, it, it, you know, you really take away someone's uh, self-determination when you do guardianship. So, I mean, there are times when, I, when it would be the right thing to do, but um, that would be really as a drastic and protective measure, which, uh, you know, is, is, is overreaching where you're, there's just a need. Um, it's a very hard time. I mean, it's a, it's a, I think the services that are in place in terms of getting people their daily necessities, getting food deliveries, those have been pretty strong. Um, and, you know, you can call 311 and having never been registered for anything previously, if you are an older adult who needs food deliveries, I, you know, it is happening. Um, but physical care of, of an individual, um, you know, if that wasn't already in place, I mean, it is a challenging time to get that. Um, you know, there are home care services, Medicaid home care services that are out there, but uh, it was always challenging, you know, to apply and get that in place and, and uh, it remains so, although it can be done remotely. Um, if you're just a concerned family member and you have a relative that needs care, um, you know, guardianship is a, a long-term process. It, it, takes, it takes, you know, months usually um, to effectuate. So it's not a short-term fix uh, in any case. Um, you know, if you suspect that someone has been a victim of a fraud or a scam, or they are actively being physically threatened, those are things that, that require fast action. And I, um, I encourage people to, you know, if you think that a person is being financially, uh, uh, you know, exploited, uh, contact their bank directly and report that you think there's fraud happening because banks actually do have some obligations to look at suspicious activity on, on bank accounts. Um, it's, it's unfortunately a difficult time to get powers of attorney when someone's already having some diminished capacity. Sorry, it's seven o'clock and there's yelling outside my window. Hold on. 
Um, uh, so, you know, it's a challenging time to sort of now realize, and I get a lot of these calls, I, I need to get power of attorney. My mother has lost capacity and that just doesn't fit together. It's too late if, if your mom has lost capacity, she can no longer give power of attorney because it's a give, not a get, you know? Um, so uh, where that's appropriate, we can, you know, we can advise and assist and direct people to the right resources. Um, but mostly what I'm hearing about are cases where it's not appropriate. Um, so, uh, but, but I'm, I'm always happy to talk about guardianship. I ran a guardianship program for five years and I, uh, know very well what it can and cannot do. I think often people think it's going to do more for them than it is. Um, and I would urge, or urge that, you know, sometimes people go to the bank for their mother and the bank says, you need to go get guardianship. That's generally not true and not helpful. Um, so um, but people can always contact me if they have questions about guardianship in my office. We, you know, we do have some expertise in that. Um, and yeah, so I'll stop there. Yeah. So, all right. So let me, um, another topic um, regarding uh, elders. Um, when we had our, our senior town hall, there was some sparks that, that flew, believe it or not. Um, the issue of nursing homes, care in nursing homes, and it's obviously a very hot and tragic topic. Um, we read in, in, I guess it was today or yesterday, um, in the paper that um, there were some kind of uh, changes to the, to the standards or the rules about when you can bring a lawsuit against a nursing home. Now, I don't think that you take these kinds of personal injury or medical malpractice cases, but but for the lay person and, and, and maybe not even the, just the lay person, what, what, is the, what, what obligation, what standard of care do the nursing homes have to their residents that, that, that has been implicated by this, 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 this temporary change in, in, in the law? And, and this is a broader temporal question. It's not, it's not a legal question per se. So I don't want you know, to push you outside of your comfort zone. Um, but you know, how comfortable should people be in sending their loved one to a nursing home? We generally think, all right, if someone goes to the hospital or something, something happens to them, there's a system in place to, to, to protect their rights. Or what, what can you tell us about that? Well, I mean, I would say, uh, um, well, two things. One, if your loved one is already in a nursing home and you have concerns about the care they're receiving, which of course people are, who are residents of nursing homes, whether temporarily or permanently, are entitled to, right, a high level of care. And, and there's, a, there's a process, if you have ongoing concerns, um, you can contact, there's a statewide uh, uh, long-term care ombudsman's office that investigates and, and you know, it's a crazy time right now, but they are still there. They still exist. They should be still checking on safety concerns. So there's that route if you have concerns. I, I, I would say, um, given the situation right now in long-term care facilities, uh, you know, good ones and, and, and not so good ones, it's not a great time to be considering putting someone in a nursing home. And I really, I understand people are struggling and sometimes just there's no other way. Someone's in the hospital and they must go to a rehab uh, even temporarily. But if I had any, uh, <laughs> if I'm advising someone and, and, I, and I do, I'm saying if you're just, you're just thinking about options for care in this moment, that would not be the one I would choose. Um, it's, just uh, it, no matter how good the facility is, um, you know, the percentage of them that have COVID cases and the mortality rate of COVID in nursing homes is, is appalling. And, and you know, um, um, I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on personal injury lawsuits because uh, that, that is outside of our um, realm. So I am not, I do not have uh, any new news on that. And I, 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 I briefly read about the change, but I don't, I don't fully understand it and, and don't want to process that here. Um, I would say if you are looking for a nursing home, New York State does a fairly good job of grading nursing homes. And you can go on the Department of Health website and actually look up 
every individual nursing home and you can see whether they have any what are called deficiencies. Um, most nursing homes have some, but you can really see how they stack up against others. Um, and it's a fairly good way to figure out, it's a, it's a rough uh, cut, but it's a way to look at quality of the care facility. And I would always, before visiting or considering a nursing home, I always um, urge people to look there first um, when you, and the other thing I would say, if you have a relative who's in the hospital and you're being pressured and being told they have to go, they have to go, there's a rehab bed at X facility, you look up that facility and you are not satisfied with what you see, it is perfectly within your rights to push back hard and say, absolutely not. It's not a safe discharge for my loved one because, and you know, say what your concerns are. Um, it's a terrible time for hospitals right now. And I, I recognize that, but, but if you're advocating for an elderly person who is needing placement, that is the moment before they go there is the moment when you can be most effective in your advocacy um, in terms of directing where they ultimately go. And oftentimes beds open up hourly. So if, if at 10 a.m. there's a bed at this terrible facility that you don't want your person to go to, if you just stall for a day even, probably something else will open up and the squeaky wheel, right, um, you, will, you will get a different placement. Um, so so I, I do advise people about that. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> that was a bit of an unfair question on my part, but um, Brian, I think this is a family, uh, domestic violence. Um, my friend is a DV survivor and she's in a bad situation. She called the police and they didn't respond. What, what can she do legally? And, and is that what you, do you do that? Do you handle that? Sure. I mean, you know, I guess there's a couple of parts to the question. I mean, one part of the question is uh, if the police don't respond in the first instance, um, that doesn't mean that the person still cannot, you know, whether it's an hour later or the next day, make another call or go down to the precinct and file a domestic incident report. And obviously, if the police take the report and they feel that there's a basis to go further, they could pursue and make an arrest if they've got probable cause. Uh, if the person is seeking to find a different living situation as quickly as possible, uh, the, you know, the domestic violence shelters in the city call to to the uh, Safe Horizons uh, hotline. We'll get them moving toward a shelter placement quickly. A uh, trip to the Family Justice Center. We'll put them in touch with uh, housing resources quickly. Uh, so there are a number of different options toward looking toward housing options. If the person is looking for an order for protection, and the, you know, we have a civil order of protection route which is available. They contact Queens Legal Services, they contact or they come through the Family Justice Center and have an opportunity to speak with one of our advocates or one of the advocates from the other organizations that represent uh, parties in family offense proceedings. We can assist in filing uh, family offense proceeding through the New York City Virtual Court. Uh, if the party wants to proceed on their own, they, they just need to move on very quickly. They can also contact the Safe Horizons and Safe Horizons will assist them in filing a pro se petition. I know in the virtual court assigned counsel are available to persons who can't afford counsel and the court will assign counsel to people seeking an order of protection. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if, if the person comes to me as an advocate before they have done anything, then we'll try to explore what are their goals and then find the appropriate services to uh, meet the goals. Okay. I should also add that Queens Legal Services has on staff uh, social workers and our social workers are experts in doing safety planning, crisis intervention, service coordination. Uh, they help people do benefits applications. They help them work on their housing issues. Um, you know, fr frankly, they're, you know, in, in our practice, uh, we can't properly service survivors without the assistance of our 
social workers who are kinds of like ombuds people when it comes to providing all the, all the services and coordination that are specifically not in the courthouses. Got it. Okay. Um, let me ask a question about uh, an employment uh, question. Um, we talked about unemployment, but what if an employer is just flat out not uh, uh, withholding someone's paycheck, um, you know, for the last two weeks or the last the last month? Um, the, the business has, is not operating because it's not an essential business. Um, what recourse does a person have if the employer is just not sending in their paychecks and holding it on to it for themselves? So that is, um, unfortunately, that's a problem, common problem now and, you know, back before the, the pandemic. Um, the typically what would the recourse for a, a person facing wage theft are uh, if they had an attorney um, like so we'll, like someone from the legal aid society we would draft what's known as a demand letter and send it to the employer saying you need to pay our client what he or she is owed um, and if not we are going to take further action um, and that often gets results. Um, no, you know, nobody likes getting a letter from a lawyer. Um, but if that does not uh, yield results, then there has to be a decision made about where a person can go next in order to try to recover that money. Um, if it's a paycheck or two, um, you know, th there's a certain irony to it. If someone's owed a lot of money, let's say tens of thousands of the dollars, sometimes it's easier to recover that uh, uh, rather than somebody who's owed, you know, a paycheck or two, a thousand dollars. And the reason for that is because if you're owed um, less than, let's say, five thousand dollars, that is what a, a small claims court matter. So people can go to small claims court, which is not open now, so that's an issue, right? But if it was open, they would go to small claims court. Um, they often could get what's a judgment, which is basically a, a piece of paper from the court saying that. Um, you know, young Lee owes you money. Um, and you would then have to go and enforce that judgment, which can cost time and uh, resources that are actually even more than maybe what you are owed. The other route um, is to file a complaint at the New York State Department of Labor. And they are still taking complaints um, for, uh, even for relatively low amounts, they will still do an investigation. Um, that is, does not cost the worker any money. Um, is the, then the Department of Labor needs to take that complaint. Um, that process can just take a very long time. Um, and that's the, another unfortunate thing. So if an employer is just not going to pay you what you are owed um, and you, know, you can't file in court, um, if you file with the Department of Labor, that process can take months or even years. Um, so there's unfortunately not a great way to get money, that money back into your pocket quickly. Um, but there are definitely different routes um, to take. Um, and if anybody is experiencing wage theft, um, they should, if they can, talk to an attorney. They can call us. There are other organizations that do this. Um, and we can walk through, walk, you know, through the different steps for you. Um, we often do the demand letters. Um, it's been more difficult now because if a business is shuttered and it's just not operating, um, there might not be any response. Um, or the person will say, well, you know, you can't get blood from a stone. You know, there's nothing, you know, we'd love to pay you, but we can't. And that creates difficulties. Um, but, you know, there are routes that you can take. Um, in New York State, the, the, the deadline, what's known as the statute of limitations to file a wage claim is six years. So there's going to be a lot of time to do so. Um, but the sooner you do, usually the sooner you do something, the better. Okay. Here's a, uh, a tenant question. Um, I had a case in housing court earlier this year for non-payment of rent, and I agreed to pay everything through March. Since then, I've lost my income. What will happen when the current moratorium ends? Yikes. Um, so it would depend on how the, the agreement was written, uh, whether or not that a person uh, had a, a possessory judgment uh, leveled against them at that point. 
Um, and it depends on when in March uh, it happened. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing likely there was a, both a, a, a monetary and possessory judgment against them. The, the landlord's likely going to apply for a warrant of eviction. They, I don't think they can do that. Right? They can't do that right now. The courts are closed. So I'd imagine when the courts reopen, um, you know, they will go put it in their put in their request for a warrant of eviction, uh, which usually takes anywhere between uh, four to eight weeks, uh, I would think, in Queens. Um, and and they'll likely try to evict. In in that time, um, that tenant should should contact an attorney, um, one, one of our organizations, and, and uh, uh, apply for something called an order to show cause. Order to show cause brings all the parties back to court um, and gives uh, that tenant an opportunity to, to explain to, to the landlords what, what has happened um, and hopefully allows them to modify the agreement to give them more time to um, pay that money. Um, so I would tell that person to, you know, continue saving, continue trying to, 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 to do what you can to pay that, pay that money, um, and then be prepared for when the courts open to file that order to show cause to bring everybody uh, back to court to kind of mod to modify that, that agreement. All right. Um, uh, here's an immigration question. Uh, I have two colleges in my district, St. John's University and Queens College. A ton of students who are here, I guess, on student visas. What, um, uh, what happens if that visa expires while we're in the middle of this crisis and, you know, people can't, can't go on a plane, school's been interrupted? Um, what, what guidance advice can you, can you give students during this time? Yeah, so if you're here on an F1 student visa and it expires, <clears throat> you can ask for an extension by filing a form I-539, which is a request for an extension or change of status. You would need to show that you're still enrolled and then you intend to be enrolled in, let's say, in the fall. But, um, but you would need to work together with the International Student Office um, at your university or your college to complete a, a service form I, um, I-20, um, and you would use that together with your request to extend your um, F-1 student visa. Okay. Um, another elder law question. Um, what is that? Sorry, just trying to decipher this. Oh, okay. Um, uh, let me reword it. W what if I have a pending case with the Department of Social Services um, or I need assistance with Social Security benefits? Um, is all of that shut down? Um, and, and how does someone handle that situation? Um, you know, they're not shut down. Um, Social Security Administration, you know, I'm assuming social services, meaning HRA, the New York City um, agency versus Social Security Administration, both are open. Um, it can be challenging to get in touch. Um, I would say HRA um, is doing a pretty good job. If this is a question around SSI, um, you know, uh, you can get help uh trying to advocate for someone through you know legal aid i think lisney like we we have uh we have practice areas around people being denied benefits if it's if it's an application just a new application people can follow the instructions online i know that's really challenging for older adults sometimes and so i would i would seek assistance for the person who's trying i can say that it has been difficult to reach the social security administration um phones are busy people are calling um you know patience and uh and and uh persistence i think is the way to go but did you have is there a more specific question about that or you know i would say ssi call legal aid, call legal services, um, 
general social security, maybe so if you're being denied benefits, but um, reaching out directly is also a possibility. They are not closed. Right. Well, the, the challenge of people asking their questions anonymously is like <laughs> hard to get into those, those nuances. Um, so this is the last question, and then I, I would invite each of you to just you know, give a little wrap up. Um, this is a, an employment uh, question. What, obligate, what legal obligation does an employer have to provide workers with masks and PPEs? Um, let's take it out of the hospital meta healthcare setting, uh, but like someone who works for a restaurant, they're delivering food or, or a driver. Um, what obligation does the, the employer have to provide them with the, with the, the PPEs? As of right now, as we stand today, there is no legal obligation for the employer to do so. But uh, there is, you know, there are proposed bills of legislations, uh, both in the state and I believe in the city council as well, in order to do so. And we, you know, we strongly advocate for that. Um, you know, there are uh, uh, the employers should be uh, providing that. I mean, we we do definitely believe that's the case. Um, you know, to the extent that, you know, people, the only people who, who should be working out in the public right now are essential workers. Um, but, you know, essential workers includes, you know, the, 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 the essential, what's essential for the rest of us, people who are delivering our food, who are working in grocery stores and restaurants, so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, and we're hoping, yeah, that, that the legislation will be passed so that employers will be obligated to actually provide the PP. Um, the, the, the PPE. Um, I want to sort of answer a different question then for those of, for people who are concerned, and we, we see this a lot, who are still going to work right now and are saying that, um, you know, I, I, I'm scared to go to work, legitimately so. What are their options? Um, if this, if you yourself are going to work and you have some kind of underlying medical condition that, you know, makes you particularly susceptible to COVID-19, um, you should try to get your doctor to document that, and you should ask your employer for a reasonable accommodation um, if they can. So if it's, if it's a job that can uh, uh, allow you to telework, um, they should consider that and allow you to telework. Um, if at the end of the day, um, the, your, your employer is unable to either accommodate you or refuses to do so, that can be against the law. But you may be able to then um, quit your job and start collecting unemployment if it comes down to the fact that you have good cause to quit, which meaning that your health and safety is in danger, um, you may be able to uh, actually stop working and collect unemployment. Um, and that would, should be good reason to quit and collect unemployment. It doesn't cover everybody. If you're just generally scared, unfortunately, you probably won't be able to collect unemployment because the Department of Labor doesn't uh, con uh, consider sort of generalized fear as a good cause to quit. You need to have some specific reason why. Oh, wait a second. I think we've got a live question. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a person a chance to give a live question and it'll be interesting because he is a contrarian. So, um, who we got? Um, Ahmed Shakir. Yes, uh, hi Rory, I'm your club member and from last many years I'm with you. Yes, it's good uh, to see I, you. Um, just, just uh, <laughs> Sam, his, his, uh, his box shows Legal Aid Society, um, but I don't want to get anyone from the Legal Aid Society uh, fired. But uh, so uh, Ahmed, go ahead, ask your question. I, I'm not sure it's a legal question, but ask your question. It, it is illegal actually for me because we are a small landlords. Uh, we have a two, three family house and I have a, about five, six tenants. These tenants are working in the restaurants and the construction and they're unemployed. They're not paying the rent. They're watching TV and they say, look, Mr. Shakir, you cannot evict us. Right now, we cannot pay you. I'm not interested to evict them anyway. But if they don't pay me the rent and if the city and governor give the extension up to August and after that, they pile up the rents. And I saw some of our tenants by taking six, seven months rent in their pocket and they leave after that. So how city can help us? Because we, I cannot uh, support those tenants from my own pocket paying water and sewer tax is so high, real estate is so high, and city wants to charge me the penalty if I don't pay on time. So what, what is my alternative? 
I need a justice. Right. So, so that's a, a, a really good question and a really you know, fair question because uh, just as employees are struggling, small businesses are, are struggling. Just as tenants are struggling, small landlords are, are struggling. They've got mortgage and, and, and taxes and electricity, et, et, et cetera. Um, so the, the policy questions of how the city is gonna support small businesses, I'm not gonna impose that on, on, on the, the, the lawyers here tonight. But, but let me ask you, do, do, um, does either Legal Aid or, or Queens Legal Services uh, uh, represent uh, small businesses, whether they're a landlord or, or a guy who owns a restaurant, um, in, in any of, of their civil litigation matters, or, or, or would they not um, qualify for that for legal assistance? Anyone? We do represent, occasionally Legal Aid represents small business owners, but they're generally the tenant, um, so a store that is renting space. You know, we have a, a, a small number of those cases, uh, mostly in our community law office in Harlem, but, um, but we do not um, generally represent landlords other than occasionally we have an individual client who's in foreclosure maybe and, and they, have a, they may have a tenant, but, um, but very limited, yeah. yeah. Right. We, Alex, we, we you, do represent, yeah. we represent uh, owners of multifamilies. We run a robust um, check to make sure that we, a conflict check to make sure that we haven't represented their tenants uh, previously. And, but if, if we haven't, we, we certainly do represent um, owners of multifamilies in Queens. Like you were saying before, there's so many two and three families uh, owner occupied. It's, it's yes, we, we do. Okay. Oh, good. That's good to know. The real answer, um, Ahmed, is, is not um, in your suing your tenants. Who, somebody earlier used the phrase uh, blood from a stone. Um, but but the city needs and the state needs to do uh, a better job of uh, supporting all of our small businesses, including our small landlords, um, as as they do not have income coming in to meet uh, their obligations. And offline, you and I can talk about some of the things that the city and state are doing and and some of the things that are that are planned. Um, for now, let me just ask each of our panelists to just give a minute or two wrapping up um, anything that you thought we would cover but we didn't um, and uh, and then we'll, 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 we'll call it a night. Why don't we start um, in the old reverse order from, 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 from our openings. So I think, I think Young, were you, you were the last one to speak? I was. All right. And I actually did want to correct something I just said before about the PPE. They, the, the employers do actually have to provide the face coverings, but nothing else beyond that. That's the, yeah. that's the, that's the actually, because that was, um, I believe that was actually an executive order by the governor for essential, for essential workers. Um, so, uh, so I, I forgive me for giving the wrong information before. Um, the, you know, I, I would just say that for anybody who does actually have any issues, and particularly right now for the people who are, um, struggling with either process, getting processed with unemployment, have questions about it, or in particular, if anybody's getting denied, um, we definitely want to hear that um, and try to help you. Um, and as people are, you know, hopefully uh, uh, in a safe manner are able to go back to work, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions um, and a lot of problems with, you know, getting paid correctly, um, making sure that people who have, um, let's say, a disability are properly accommodated. Um, or people who are having to deal with their own sickness or a family member's sickness and ha needing to take time off. Um, you, there are many different laws that protect you. Um, and, you know, we definitely want to try to help as many people as we can um, go back to work, hopefully, and, or get money that they desperately need right now, um, but also stay safe uh, and, you know, make sure their families are safe. Thank you. Uh, listen, I've completely forgot the order that we started in. So, um, I, uh, Alex raised his finger. He goes next. I, I think I'm next. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I just want to. Uh, I just. I. I want to highlight the importance of communication um, during these these scary times um, for the 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 small landlord who is um, you know 
unable to pay their mortgage, communicate with your servicer. Let them know what's going on. Uh, to the tenants who can't pay their rent, communicate to your landlord. Let them know what's going on. Um, and hopefully uh, with, with communication, um, maybe we could avoid some of the, the legal issues that we're all kind of expecting to happen at the end of COVID. And, and um, you know, maybe we can work out uh, solutions before we, we get to court. Thank you. Uh, Jean, you want to go next? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think I would say, you know, um, not so much a legal uh, perspective, but there are some gaps in services for older adults. And one of the things in particular that I've noticed is that it's very hard to get food to people, even if they want to pay, they want just to get their grocery delivery that they used to get before COVID. And there's no time slots available or they don't have access to the internet. And um, I've been heartened to see neighborhood services, very specific local services, but disappointed that there wasn't more uh, in place for those folks. But um, so I'm really encouraging people to look, if you know of older adults who are, are struggling to just get groceries in the house or meals, del you know, delivered, um, look to really robust neighborhood services where people are just volunteering to do the shopping and deliver the groceries and 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 the person can pay for it um you know to the to the person who brings the groceries um but it it really struck me at what a gap that is that you really can't expect people in their 80s and 90s to schlep over to the local supermarket in these times and yet that is in fact what we were expecting them to do because there were no alternatives early on i feel like it's gotten a little better um, so that's my plug. Great. Um, uh, Hassan, I think you were first. I do okay. think you were first. I'm not going to second, but I'll, I'll be second to last. No, no, no. <laughs> Brian, Brian, you're the, you're the penultimate. Oh, okay. Yeah. So all I would say is right now immigrants have been under attack for the last couple of years under this administration. If you need assistance, the New York um, New York City has set up a, a network called Action NYC. You can, the easiest way to get immigration assistance from any of the providers, whether it's Legal Aid or Liz Near or the others, is to call 311 and ask for Action NYC and they'll, they'll connect you. If they can, if Action NYC can do the case themselves, great. Otherwise, they'll send you to Legal Aid or Liz Near or any of the other organizations that do the more complex cases. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Brian, you are the ultimate then. Okay, so um, I, I always encourage people to get information to help them make informed decisions. For our clients and our callers who are survivors and they're living uh, in fear of their safety, if necessary, call the police. I'm sure the police will respond, get to a place of safety, and then call for legal assistance afterwards. For everybody else, our organizations, we, we have lots of resources to talk about family matters. For the kinds of questions that have come up during the public health emergency, we, we are very happy to discuss with parents whether there have been a change of circumstances that warrants changes in the way that parenting time is allocated and the way their children uh, should be spending time between their parents or not spending time between their parents. For folks who are in situations where they need to have support modifications, we're very happy to review whether there's a basis to have that modification and how the courts will, you know, view the timing of the modification. Um, you know, for people who are seeking divorce, believe me, in a month or six weeks or whenever it is, the courts are going to be accepting divorce filings again and people will be allowed to separate themselves and move in that direction for their lives. But the importance of getting information isn't just to go forward with court proceedings. In many instances, it's also to talk about whether there are alternatives to going forward with court proceedings. For those of us who work on family issues, when possible, we absolutely encourage people to try to make their own decisions because they're able to keep some, some sense of control in their lives when it can be done safely and when it's possible. You know, going to court turns those decisions over to third parties. And we know that the courts care about what they do, but they can't possibly make better decisions than we think parents ought to be able to make. And so I would absolutely encourage people to seek out the resources ahead of time if you can. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. There was a lot of information tonight uh, covering uh, really a whole spectrum of, of services and, and needs. Um, these reflect the kinds of questions that we're getting uh, uh, in the office and that I'm hearing from people. Uh, and uh, each of you took an hour and a half out of your, your life to, to be on this call. And I appreciate it and, and more to, to prepare for it. Uh, so I, I, uh, I'm very, very grateful. Um, for those of you who are, who are still tuned in, um, this has been our sixth town hall on uh, this one on, on legal services issues, obviously. We will have another one next week, topic to be determined. In the meantime, please make sure to sign up for our daily email blast uh, at rlancement at council.myc.gov. Uh, you can call us uh, with your any issues or needs that you have or anything you want to follow up with from today's uh, conversation. We are able to, to be in touch with these, these wonderful legal services providers. My number is 718-217-4969. Twitter is at Rory Lantzman. Facebook, my father, Facebook page, Rory Lantzman. And of course, my city council uh, website. That, uh, that wraps up for this evening. And, and thank you, of course, to my, my colleagues, my co-hosts. Uh, everyone stay safe, stay well, and I look forward to seeing you in person and shaking your hand one day soon. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you.